feels like it's been forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> getting direction. I'm, feels like it's been forever since we've been here. Um, for me, it's been over a month because I was in San Diego with my grandbaby and then I came home a little under the weather, but I'm so thankful. So today I had a great and glorious day because I watched um, my favorite women's Bible study teacher <laughs> um, teaching on Esther chapter 3 and chapter 4. So I just want to remind you that the teachings are available, that you can go back and you can watch them with your notepad. And the cool thing is you can push pause and rewind, and which I did, which I did quite a few times. So um, we're just thankful. And I just want to remind us that um, Esther 3, she talked about remembering that God put um, festivals in place so that we would remember how critical it is for us to remember what God has done, who God is. And then last week, well, three weeks ago, um, talking about that defining moment. That was so powerful. And we may not be a defining moment in a nation's existence, but like she shared the story of Jason in one person. And then that one person can be a defining moment in another person's. And, and, um, so to be surrendered in obedience and ready to say yes, um, no matter what. So tonight, I'm excited because I don't know what she's got for us, but it's always good. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just humbly bow before you with such gratitude, God, for your living word, active and sharp and judging our thoughts and our motives. And we're so grateful because we need that, Lord. And we so desire to be women like Esther who say yes, even without knowing what's coming and trusting in your faithful almighty powerful hand to do and accomplish your perfect will so lord we pray that you would ignite a fire that you would instruct us that we would grow in our faith and in our surrendered obedience as a result of being face to face with your word this evening use our sister karen we thank you for her we pray a blessing over her and uh, we just look forward to what you have for us, that we might be um, living testimonies of your truth. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Karen. I'm glad to see y'all. Two weeks was too much to be apart. So I'm glad to see everybody here uh, back tonight. And I want to just start it out our time together uh, before we get going uh, with a bit of current news. And Jennifer Martin shared this with me last week, which I thought was really cool. Because back in December, there's these two guys who were kind of walking across an archaeological site in Israel, and they happened to stumble upon this little bitty piece of pottery out there. And on it was the name carved in it of Darius the Great. And if you remember, here, here's a picture of it. We can't read ancient Persian, but that's what it is. And it says Darius the Great on it. And it's significant because it's the first time that anything... Uh, with Darius's name on it has been found in Israel. <coughs> and so if you were here at the beginning of our study of Esther, you'll know when we did all the, the history lessons is that Darius the Great is the father of Xerxes, who is one of the star players in our story. And, uh, and he, he, Darius is actually the one who expanded the, uh, the uh, Persian Empire to the 127 provinces that it talks about in Esther chapter 1. And um, so uh, King Xerxes, uh, you know, he is the, the ruler and the husband of Esther. And um, she, he, uh, uh, you know, we're going to study and learn more about Purim uh, as we go along in our study. But actually Purim started for the Jewish uh, people yesterday. And um, so oh. uh, I think this is really cool. And because what this celebration entails, part of what it entails is a, a, a reading out loud of the entire book. Of, of Esther, and so uh, we'll learn more about that in detail, like I said, in a few weeks, but I thought this is really a cool current day reminder here that this is not just a story. This is not something about somebody made up. This is actual, true, uh, uh, historical fact, ground, you know, grounded in something we can be um, be certain of, and you know, I, I read actually a, an article just this week, too, that talked about that there really hasn't been any archaeological discovery that has undermining the Bible. None. And, uh, and in fact, they keep 
It keeps affirming what we already know as believers, as this book, Esther, and the whole of the Bible is actual history and supported by archaeology. And, it, and the, here's the thing for us, that it is a reminder that God's word is true and reliable for all things. Like mm -hmm. Paul, Paul says in Timothy, for teaching, correction, training in righteousness, so that we'll be equipped to do whatever God calls us to do. So I thought that was a really uh, very timely thing for what we're studying. But uh, we'll get to Esther chapter 5 tonight. Um, and I started out with this book, as some of you guys know who John Piper is. Well, he write, wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Life uh, several years ago. And in it, he quotes a story that he read in um, Reader's Digest many years ago. And it was about this couple that took early retirement, and they lived in the Northeast. He was 59, she was 51, and they moved to Florida, sold all their stuff, bought a 30-foot trawler, and, uh, and they now cruise on their trawler, uh, or then, uh, cruise on their trawler, uh, play softball, and collect shells. That's what they're doing in their retirement. And Piper writes in his book, he says, at first, uh, when I read it, I thought it was a joke, a spoof on Amer the American dream. But it wasn't. Tragically, this was the dream. Come to the end of your life. Your one and only precious God-given life and let the last great work of your life before you give an account to your creator be this. Playing softball and collecting shells. Picture them before Christ at the great judgment day. Look, Lord, see my shells? And this is a tragedy, he writes. And he said, I don't want you to stand before God and only be able to say, look, Lord, see my shells in my boat. And, you know, a lot of Christians, especially Western Christians, look at life kind of like that. I mean, we would laugh at that and go, no, it's not shells and softball. But uh, what we kind of do is we kind of focus on comfort and pleasure and the easy life and don't disturb me and don't, don't uh, ask me to do anything hard, Lord. <laughs> because, you know, if we are asked a lot of times, you know, what are you going to do for retirement? A lot of times it is something like that, something very just, you know, make me happy, keep me entertained, those sorts of things. But that misplaced objective focused on the here and now instead of on eternity ends up keeping us from stepping out in faith and doing something that maybe God would call us to do that might be hard or might require a lot of us because our focus becomes inward on ourselves and safety and self-preservation instead of asking God, what do you want me to do? What should I do with this portion of my life, whether you be young, middle-aged, or older? You know, so, uh, and without a resolute commitment to the uh, eternal things instead of temporary things, we suddenly drift away from what God has called us to do and what he has uh, uh, put in our hearts to do, and that maybe requires a lot. It maybe requires some risk-taking, and uh, we become defocused, and then we focus on just making decisions that have only the here and now in our minds. So. Last time when we were together, we saw that Esther had moved away from that attitude, that self-focused attitude. And thanks to Mordecai's wise words, she began to see her life differently. Not just how do I stay safe and how do I keep my head down and make it through uh, the, the Persian court here, um, but to abandon security, to abandon uh, all that, that, that would make her safe and to risk her life by going out on a limb for God's people. And Mordecai kind of called her up and told her, it's like, you need to intervene. You have been positioned for such a time as this to plead to uh, King Xerxes to get her, him to overturn Haman's uh, plan to exterminate the Jews. Uh, but without an invitation, we remembered last time that, you know, it was against the law for her to just launch on in there and go in to see the king. You didn't do that. Uh, she could die. This is a very, very real threat. In fact, uh, she, uh, remembered that the only exception for her to be able to do that was that he would hold out the golden scepter to her. In fact, the default was that they were going to kill you, and it was only ever turned if he had mercy on you and reached out to you and said, it's okay to come in. And so Esther would have been very well aware of the protocol. This is, she probably had witnessed this happen before. If, if, uh, you know, so if, Mer if uh, Xerxes is not in the mood to see her, it can go very badly. Uh, if we back all the way up to chapter 1, we already know what happens to his wife who doesn't follow his instructions, right? We know Vashti's gone and off the scene. That's how Esther moves into to the place of being the queen. So there's a real risk here. 
to ask, uh, so as we open chapter 5, we jump forward in three, uh, three days from where we left off at chapter 4, and we'll come back to that at the end. But for now, remember, for Esther's role in this story has changed from passive to active. She was taking orders, kind of just doing what she's been told, and then at this point in the story, she moves into action and, uh, uh, and as a result of this new vision that Mordecai had cast for her. And so she stopped being afraid for her safety and started moving. She instructed her maids and all of Susa to, to go into a fast for three days, and then she acts. So she risked her life literally here and walks forward in faith that God has positioned her here, like we said, for such a time as this. And so we start jumping into verse 1. We say, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes. Now, this is an all-day affair. She has been in fasting clothes. She has been sequestered away for three days. And if you think back to high school, when you went to prom, what that was like, you know, you got the hair and the dress and the makeup and all that. It took you all day to do it. Or if you're on your wedding day, how long it took you to get ready. And so she is cleaned up. Her maids are fixing her hair, and she looks her very best. But she is not going into this with anticipation like you might would on your wedding day or prom, but with a whole lot of fear because of the real risk that she has in front of her. Now, we have the benefit of knowing the end of the story that everything goes really well, but she doesn't know and can't know how this is going to work out. So she's all dressed up, and then she stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. So if you can get this picture in your mind, right, it's a very formal setting here, king on his throne, and she comes into this inner court and maybe peeking around the corner just to see what the mood is in the room, and uh, you can almost feel the tension that is uh, happening right here if you push yourself there. And so, uh, so he sees her, and he says, when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her. And so a big smile comes on his face, and uh, the better translation of that word uh, for pleased with her is obtained favor or found favor. Uh, and it's important because really, if you go back and look uh, so far where we've come through these four chapters, there are four references to Esther who has found favor with somebody. And so it, that the other two... Three places are in Esther chapter two, 2, verse 9, 15, and 17, which tells us something about her character. She's not brash. She's not pushy. She's not bossy. She has grace and demeanor. And as a result, he held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. Yay, she's not struck down, hooray. <laughs> but because this was highly, highly, highly unusual for anybody, especially the queen, to come to the court like this, he's got to look at her and go, what's up? This is really strange. And he's very curious to find out what she, why she's there. He's been, remember, it's been 30 days since he's even seen her. And so then he basically asks, so queen, what's up, Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom will be given to you. Now that expression, half the kingdom, is not literal. He's not really going to give her 60 of his provinces if, if she asks for it. It's just a phrase, that, a term phrase for this time that means that he was willing to be generous toward her. And so, you now thinking about the, uh, that this first part went so well that he didn't strike her down, that you know she's still got to be full of nerves and nervousness, you'd think, well, this is a great time. Go ahead, go and ask. Just go ahead and get this out of the way. But that's not what she said. Verse 4 says, If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come to a banquet I have prepared for him. So what's up with the banquet, right? He just said he's favorably inclined to, to answer a request. Why not just go ahead and say it? Well, there's a couple of things in play in here. And why it makes more sense for her to, to invite him to the banquet is because what she's asking is really big. Like, really, really, really big. It probably would have been easier for him to give her 60 provinces than to do what she's about to ask him to do. But she is asking that the king overturn an irreversible law that was authored by his right-hand man. And that's got the stamp of his own signet ring. So, and for all intents and purposes, this is his law. And nobody, you know, very few people from Egypt 
to, um, to India or whatever know anything about Haman's involvement in this. They just see this is a new law from the king. So she's asking that he overturn a law that he has basically authored. And the foundation of her request is going to reveal her Jewish heritage. And so, now that, that might not matter at all to Xerxes, but she doesn't know uh, if that matters at all or not. But at the very least, she has kept this secret from him for five years. And so she's going to have to explain that. Why, why didn't, have I just heard about that now? And uh, she is going to ask him something that is going to be very hard for him to say yes to in the midst of a courtroom without him being uh, embarrassed for, uh, for him to save face. Now, remember the story of John the Baptist in the New Testament? Uh, Salome danced for King Herod. You remember that story? Uh, and he liked it so much that he made a similar decor declaration to her and said, you ask for what you want, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. And when she asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter, he was, this was in front of all the people in, at the party, and it would have been really hard for him to say no without being embarrassed or backed down from what he said. So even though he liked John the Baptist and, and, and liked to listen to him uh, to preach, he, he, he couldn't say no because of what he, this declaration that he met, had made there in front of all these people. So here in front of the royal court, Esther is asking for Xerxes to basically say that he made a mistake in approving of this law. Now remember, this is not just uh, 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 um, Esther and... Xerxes here in the courtroom, there'll be all the advisors, there will be soldiers there, there'll be attendants there. There's a lot of people who would be in the courtroom there with him. And so remember that Haman had the signet ring, right? And this law has Xerxes' stamp of approval on it. So as far as it stands, it's his law, not Haman's. And so does Xerxes really know what Haman's up to? As we get along in the story a little bit more, we'll find out that the answer to that question is no. Uh, but uh, but he doesn't. He probably doesn't really even care that much. But Esther's about to ask for him to under, overturn this law that he made. It's going to be hard for a proud man like Xerxes to to say yes to that without f looking foolish or manipulated by his right hand man or trying to be manipulated by Esther. So it's a really hard thing that, that she's going to ask here, and out here in front of all the court with all the people is going to make it even harder. So this private fees would make provide an arena where that it would just be the two of them and Haman and eliminate Esther potential, potentially embarrassing the king. So verse 5 says, bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asked. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther prepared. So they were drinking wine. The king again asked Esther, and now what is your position? It will be given to you, and what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted and so this is the moment we're waiting for right she, she let's, let's go and say esther but here's what she says my petition and my request is this if the king regards me with favor and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request let the king and haman come tomorrow to the banquet i will prepare for them then i'll answer the king's question we're like really another party <laughs> if, but if you look closely at the words that she says here, this is some clever uh, way that she states this. It just wasn't another invitation, but she has connected his willingness to come to that second banquet with his commitment to say yes. See here? It says, if the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, so if the answer to these two questions is yes, he's going to show up. So if he shows up, he's basically already committed himself to say yes to what she is going to ask. By ha having Haman there, of course, it's not going to give him time to wiggle out. This is a slimy dude, right? He's going to come up with all kinds of things to work around and, and uh, try to get out of this. But Esther knows that she has the element of surprise in her favor. Since Haman does not know that she is a Jew, he's in effect put forth a plan to murder the queen. And this is going to be a big trap that she hopes will close on him. So another part is the plan. And, but when the three of these people leave this one banquet, you know, we got uh, Xerxes goes this way, Esther goes this way, but the story is going to follow Haman out of the room. So got Haman went out that day happy and in high 
the spirit. So no doubt feeling very confident and self-assured. He's not only got the favor of the king, but it looks like he has the favor of the queen now too. And to be invited to the second private banquet. And here's what he says. He says, Haman went out, made it happy and high in spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. And so he nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, all the way the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above up the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And tomorrow has invited me along with the king tomorrow. <clears throat> but all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. So we see now here how unbalanced Haman is, right? I mean, he's just listed all these wonderful things he's got going on in his life. Well, heirs, power, position, favor, but he can't focus on anything but Mordecai's uh, that he won't bow to him. And uh, we think this is so ridiculous, and we're like, how can anybody be like this? But let me tell you this, we do this all the time. Yeah. We do this all the time. If I gave everybody a sheet of blank paper here and I said, just, just take, you know, 10, 15 minutes and write down all the blessings that you have from God in your life, it probably wouldn't take us long to get a significant amount filled up. Maybe some of us could get both sides of it. We could list things like family and health and long life and let alone all the spiritual things we have. We have salvation and provision and we have the gift of the Holy Spirit and we had a copy of the God's Word and we got spiritual gifts and we got comfort and we got all these things that God has poured into our lives. We could just keep going, 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 but let one thing happen that didn't go well for us in, in the day and what are we focused on? that completely to the exclusion of everything else we have in our lives. And you know what? We forget all those things and become obsessed over one irritation or one bothersome thing. It doesn't even have to be a big thing. We get all focused on that and we've forgotten everything that God has done for us. Now, you know this is true, right? We all do this. We just drift right into this. And we'll talk about this a little bit more next week when we come back to this. But this is how Satan works. He is going to narrow your field of vision onto what you don't have to the exclusion of everything else you do have. And we've got to be careful not to play into that strategy. It'll convince you to do all kinds of wrong things that are not the will of God when we get focused on what we think we don't have and forget what we do have. And so after hearing this sob story, his wife makes a suggestion. His wife's there. All his friends said to him, have a gallows built 75 feet high, ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to dinner and be happy. And so, now when you think gallows here, don't think Old West gallows here with the rope and the drop floor and the little platform, right? What we see in the Old West movies, right? The Hebrew term for gallows here is the same Hebrew, same word for tree, but it's best understood as stake or spike. And those, because those ex executed by Persians during this time were impaled rather than hung like what we normally think about with the, the rope. And this 75-foot gallows or the 75-foot stake here, ludicrous suggestion. Remember the, uh, the picture I showed you of Xerxes' palace from a few weeks ago? That's only 45 feet tall. This is 75 feet tall. And so some commentators that I read, read suggested that maybe they put the spike up on top of a hill and the 75 feet was from the top of that all the way down to the valley of that. But it doesn't really matter. The point here is that Haman's wife and his friends not only wanted to execute Mordecai, but to disgrace and humiliate him in a way that would make his execution visible to everybody in Susa. And so... Basically, the idea is, is that if Mordecai wants to stand up, then why don't you stand him up on a pole to show everyone what happens when you defy the great and mighty Haman? And so, obviously, this suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. And this is an overnight project. It's a one-day building project, not a long thing. So Haman loves this idea and gets them to work right away. And so this concludes chapter 5, and where we stop for tonight, so basically left with a cliffhanger. 
Esther has a plan and Haman has a plan. It's basically which one of these plans will be carried out first and who is going to emerge from all of this intrigue. But that'll have to wait till we get to chapter 6 and when we see what else happens. But for tonight, as we always do, we're going to have some application from chapter 5. And I want to write, uh, wrap up our time with application by going back to the beginning of chapter 5. So if you have your paper Bible <laughs> or a sheet from tonight, if you want to write this on that, I want you to go to the top of the white space and you can transfer this to, from, from this into your regular Bible if you're a Bible writer. Uh, and, and write it in that blank space between the bottom of chapter 4 and the top of chapter 5. I, I, I want you to write in there this phrase in just a second. It says, because what happens for the rest of the story, for the rest of everything else to the end of this book, is grounded in this white space. It's grounded in where there's no words in there. And I want you to write down, if you write in your Bible, before you act, wait for God. Before you act, wait for God. Because that's the takeaway from this chapter. Uh, now, if it says that Esther went and she called for a three-day fast, and there's some commentators that say that the Jews were probably just ritually fasting and not praying, not necessarily praying, but I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> I mean, if you are facing the destruction of your entire people group, and, uh, and you were from a family who was trained up in the knowledge of God. You had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the stories and everything is your history. I mean, even if you weren't necessarily a praying person at this time in your life, but if Mordecai showed up, knocked on your door, and said, Hey, Queen Esther is going to go plead for our people in three days. Will you join us in a fast? I'm thinking you're, if you have, you're not a praying person, you're going to try it right now. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, because this is really important. So, but prayer and fasting is so interlinked and connected in Bible, it's almost when you say one, you're saying the other. So, uh, even though it just says fasting, you can better bet there was a lot of praying going on. And while they were fasting and praying, God guided Esther to come up with this shrewd plan of action in that blank space. She fasted and prayed, and he led her to know what to say to come up with I mean who comes up with these two banquet ideas right that came from God <laughs> that's just not just something that she would think would the logical thing would to do but he gave her insight he gave her this ideas and he was doing also the things that she couldn't do which is influence Xerxes to be predisposed toward her he's a volatile guy he just does all kinds of crazy things for no reason at all and left to his own without prayer and fasting who knows how this thing goes right so through prayer in that blank space that looks like not a lot is going on the most important things are going on and and, and this lack of visible act uh, activity from the horizontal there was actually a lot of activity on the vertical right lots of prayer going up and lots of guidance coming down now for us, we don't usually do things this way. When we face a crisis or an irritation or something that's going on in life, we, we don't usually call people to come and fast and pray for us. We really don't. Usually, we err on two sides of this. We either rush into a situation full speed ahead with my best, bet, uh, best thinking of how this should work and just do what we think that might look like the obvious thing to do. Or we stall and stall and stall and stall because we're too afraid to act. And instead of stepping into a situation that has an uncertain outcome, we hope it'll just go away and resolve on its own. We don't do anything. And neither of those strategies is the right thing to do. So we have to be careful not just assuming they know that we might have the right answers and the right course of action and launch out on our own in, in, intuition without any guidance from God. We also have to be careful not to use prayer and seeking God as an excuse for not taking action when he calls us to do something. So there's great wisdom in waiting. But you know this, right? Anybody ever send an email or a text mm -hmm. and tomorrow wish you hadn't? <laughs> right. Yes. Or, on the other hand, have you ever failed to act and wish you had? Uh, about this time last year, um, I have been in a Bible study with a group of girls for 15 years, and um, we were we do it um, September to um, June every year. And we were about April of last year. We we're wrapping up uh, that, this session. And one of our longtime members, you know, she had a brain bleed uh, out of the blue. She was working in her garden and she um, 
she got dizzy, told her husband to take her to the hospital, and she never came home. Very shocking. Uh, you know, she's my age, you know, no, like she said, no, out, of, out of the blue. And my other friend in this group, she, uh, she called me one day, and she said, she said, and so we were praying, instead of ending up our Bible study, we were preparing for a funeral, and she called me one day, and she said, she said, you know, um, Terry's husband called me and asked the two of us to speak at the funeral. What should I tell him? And I said, you say yes. Call him back and say yes. And she said, I, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't speak at his funeral. And I, and I talked to her and I said, look, um, you have one shot to honor your friend. And if you don't do this, you will regret it the rest of your life. I said, so it's not about you. <laughs> Step up and let's do it. And she did. And we did. And uh, because... You know, if you're afraid and you back down, sometimes you regret these opportunities that God put right in front of you. And so, um, you know, and there wasn't really any risk for her. She just was nervous about standing up in front of a crowd. Not like what Esther faced. But so we have to be really careful not to let fear be the loudest voices in our decision-making process, right? Because sometimes we have to do it despite fear. That's what courage is, that you step into something even when you are afraid. And you also have to be careful not to let your own voice, that is your own reasoning power, be the basis for making your decisions either. So Esther, before this big fearful moment, uh, she walked in the essence of Isaiah chapter 4. You know, this is familiar verses, uh, but if you're not uh, familiar with them, these are great. You should memorize these. These are just so awesome. So we'll just look at them for a second as we kind of get toward the end. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. Now, this is an amazing description of God, right? He is everlasting. He is creator. His power is inexhaustible. Uh, he has all understanding. And if you need something, he has it. He has what we need every single time. And his greatness is is not just that he is strong, but he is strong on behalf of us and works for us. He isn't just powerful, but he uses that power on our behalf. And then it goes on in verse 29 and 30. He says he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. The youths grow weary and tired, and, young, and vigorous young men stumble badly. Hold there for a second. Most of the people in this room in here would probably not categorize ourselves and have the strength of a young, vigorous person, right? I mean, uh, most of us don't. We wouldn't say that I am either youthful or that I am like a vigorous young man. But even if you do, and even if you are at the peak of your health and uh, fitness and vitality and everything, this is what this says is your, your strength is going to fail. It will. Not, it might, and not even a little bit. It's going to stumble badly that your strength that will not carry you through. Uh, and you don't have what it takes to make it on your own. It goes on in verse 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord. Now that doesn't say those who pray to the Lord. That doesn't say those who believe in the Lord. That doesn't say those who work for the Lord. That it says those who wait for the Lord. <laughs> that is, we have an expected attitude of faith in God. That's what that means. To wait for the God is to have an expectant attitude of faith in him. And he says those that do that will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. So look what waiting for God does for you. Look at this now. It gives you new strength. That's what it says right there. The word there sometimes for new strength is sometimes uh, translated renew, which needs to be put on afresh. Put on, put on afresh every day. And the idea is that as we wait, as we have that expectant, expectant waiting faith in God, it, it, uh, we may feel tired. We may feel overwhelmed, unsure. But waiting on God allows you to tap into his strength that's inexhaustible and to draw on an unending supply of sustenance. Fresh every day. That means no matter what happens to you today, there's something new tomorrow. And he gives us a well of his strength to draw on as we wait on him. So waiting on the Lord gives us a new strength, gives us a new perspective. That is, mount up with wings like eagles. You think about a soaring eagle. How different does the terrain look for an eagle than, say, a rabbit? Rabbit's down in here. He sees the grass. That's all he can see. He can't see any what's coming for him. He can't see what's behind him. But, but, or even a big elephant. 
He still looks at the trees when he's going through the trees, going through the jungle, but not the eagle. The eagle soars above, has completely different perspective on its surroundings. And um, waiting for God does that for us. It lifts us above our problems. And so what you couldn't see before, you were down in the, in the weeds, you were down in the trees, you couldn't see anything. As we wait on him, it helps us see and understand what's really going on. So new strength, new perspective. New energy, it says. They will run and not get tired. If you've ever thought you're too tired to pray, then you are just disconnecting from his ability to infuse you with what only he can give. And then lastly, it gives us new endurance. That is, they will walk and not become weary. And we talked about this in the book of James. If you were here for that study, that uh, uh, if you've read that book, you know that endurance is what God is always working in us, no matter what problem or difficulty we have culty we have, that's part of what he's doing in us, is building up a sense of perseverance and endurance to keep on going and keep on going. And sometimes we get tired and weary, right? We really are zapping our energy, but as we seek God, as we wait on him, he builds into us that inner resolve that helps us to keep going no matter what, so that we can face fearful things uh, in life and not give up. And that enduring spirit leads us to what spiritual maturity is what James tells us. And it's a necessary part of growing in Christ's likeness. So fearful things are going to happen. They are. Things that just irritate us are going to happen. A crisis situation, things that bother us. Really, chapter 5 gives us in Esther and Haman the difference between the natural response to do the, these things and the supernatural response to those things. See, we have Haman's response versus Esther's response. He elevated himself. He talked about how great he was. He loved all the things that he had and uh, the special attention he was getting from the king. And Esther humbled herself. She was the queen. She could go talk to him, you know, if, the, if he was, she was inviting him. She did have a royal position, but she emptied herself of that and went to fast and pray. Haman boasted. Esther beseeched. Haman plotted. And Esther pleaded. This is the difference in how they approach the, the same problems that were in front of them. So what do you do when you face life's trouble? Whether you realize it or not, every opportunity, every problem is an opportunity that, to prove God's power in your life. Every single one of them. Big, small, crisis, kind of just irritations, all those things. Because we, uh, in, we uh, encounter these things that are brilliantly disguised by God uh, to reveal where your trust really is. Is it in you and what you can do or in God and what he does? God orchestrates these situations and allows them where we feel out of control so that we might seek him, so that we might turn to him, that we might ask him to show us what to do. And our needs, our difficulties, and even our irritations, they shake us and show us where our trust really lies. And, uh, and so what do we do when they, when they come into our lives? On whom do we really rely? Is it me? Is it the government? Is it friends and family? Or is it on God? Do you fall to de de feelings of feeling like God has abandoned you or doesn't love you when things don't turn out right, despite what the Bible actually says, that he never leaves you or forsakes you? Do you trust no matter what? Can you echo with jo Job to say he gives and he takes away? But blessed be the name of the Lord. See, we really don't have any answers we don't really know what's going on most of the time. I mean, we have no idea what the little pieces are behind the, what we're encountering with other people, right? Like Esther, she didn't really see what the bigger plan was, the big spiritual part that was going on, uh, that was battling behind the scenes, that, that what she was encountering right there was actually Satan's actively, uh, plan to actively work to derail the redemptive plan of God for all humanity. That's what was going on there, but she didn't know that. She didn't know that. She was just seeing what was on the surface. She didn't know that he was trying to, that Satan was trying to use Haman to, uh, to stop the coming of the Messiah. So she needed to seek God, and she needed to wait for him. And in response, God gave her unusual wisdom, unusual favor. <clears throat> that didn't come without asking and waiting. She needed to seek him in prayer, fasting, to know what to do and how to do it. And I love this verse. We'll, we'll end with this tonight. 
Isaiah 64, 4 identifies God as the one who had acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Love that, right? <laughs> what a wonderful promise that he is working on our behalf as we wait for him. So while we actively wait, he actively works. While we seek, he shows, and while we rest, he rescues. Those are the things that we can count on there, right? And so think of this. Every single day we have the greatest mediator, Christ himself, at the right hand of the Father, working on our behalf. And when things seem to go wrong, he is there making sure that everything unfolds the way, exactly the way it's supposed to. Now, waiting is one of the more difficult things that we do in the Christian life. We talk about that in our groups tonight, but it's not wasted time. Now, it can look like that blank space, it, that it is that blank space from the horizontal, but in those times of purposefully seeking God and giving ourselves to Him, He gives us instructions uh, through those periods of waiting. And He gives us so much more. He might change the circumstances, He might not. They might actually get worse. I mean, sometimes that happens, right? But as we walk and wait for him, we walk in step with him, and he prepares us to receive the answers he does want to give us. And so and as we wait, the number one and best thing that he does, uh, that we do in those times of waiting, is we get to know him. And we deepen our knowledge and understanding of him, and that is never wasted time. And that's really what gets us through the rough times, right? Not having the right answers or even getting the right answers. It's about knowing God and being assured that we are never alone. That the one who knows and controls all knows exactly how long we need to wait and what we need to know in that time of waiting. And it's our job to trust him and be patient because he's bringing forth his plan in his own time. And so that's where we'll stop tonight. We're going to come back next week, and we're going to talk a little bit more about prayer because it is, we can't, I don't think I could overestimate the importance of prayer and understanding and listening to God. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that before we move on to Chapter 6, but we will pick that up next week, come back and uh, kind of go over the beginning, end of 4 and 5 again, and then jump over to see what Jesus actually has to say about prayer because I think a lot of us are, have a tenuous relationship, not knowing, except I'm supposed to bring and ask him for stuff, but what else? And Jesus answers that question for us. So anyway, we'll be back next week. But in that, before then, we'll break up in our groups. Let me pray for us. God, we are so great, grateful, so grateful that you um, are willing to talk to us. And I know that uh, you are much more willing to reveal things to us uh, if we would just spend some time and wait for you. God, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who helps interpret all of the, the things we need to know to us. God, give us hearts to pull away from our problems and not just rush into them on our own initiative, but to trust you to give us the right thing to do at the right time. Mm -hmm. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.